I, my name is Michael Collins, and I have the privilege of being the Director General of this wonderful institute, the Institute of International and European Affairs um, uh, here in North Great Georgia Street. And we're delighted to see so many people here uh, this evening, and welcome in particular uh, to our distinguished guests, uh, particularly, of course, Eleanor uh, Sharpton and Justice Liam McKechnie, and of course, President um, Philip Nolan from Maynooth, whom, uh, from whom you'll be hearing very, very shortly. Um, we are delighted uh, and um, we're thrilled to uh, cooperate with Maynooth University in hosting uh, this event, this indeed important event, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of uh, Maynooth Law School. It may not be the oldest university, or the, the oldest law school in the world, but 10 years is good too, 20 years will be better, 50 years will be really, really good, <laughs> and 100 years will be spectacular, but um, in any event. Uh, so congratulations to everybody associated with the law school in Maynooth in reaching and marking uh, this important uh, milestone. I wish you all the very best uh, as the school strives and I'm sure reaches levels of uh, continuing success uh, in the years ahead. Uh, the IA is particularly honored to host uh, our keynote speaker, Advocate General um, Eleanor Sharpston, and to welcome her particularly to the Institute uh, here, here, here this evening. Her reputation uh, precedes her. Uh, indeed, I was reading a little bit about her background. And apart from being in awe, <laughs> it, made, it made some very, very entertaining reading as well. Uh, Eleanor, I know uh, that your career path has been at times uh, both challenging and uh, demanding, uh, and indeed demanding more than a fair share of persistence and uh, determination. Uh, this makes your success in reaching the position of Advocate General all the more commendable and indeed impressive. And we salute your success and are delighted that you can share this time with us here in the heart of Dublin uh, here at the Institute this evening. Eleanor, I know that your friends call you Leo. You're among friends uh, tonight, so we're going to call you Leo as well, if we may. But whether we call you Leo or Eleanor, uh, your welcome here is profound and it's sincerely um, held. I now want to hand over uh, to the president of Maynooth, Philip uh, Nolan, whom I've uh, had the privilege of meeting before, uh, but, uh, but, but Leo. Uh, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here at the final event uh, to uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary uh, of the, the School of Law at Maynooth, at Maynooth University, uh, beautifully coinciding with the 10th anniversary of the enactment of, or the coming into effect of the uh, Lisbon Treaty. Uh, it's impolite to uh, disagree with your host, but I'm going to uh, do it anyway. Um, 10 years is great, and in fact, 20 years or 50 years isn't necessarily better. Um, and, and my point is, uh, I had the privilege of appointing uh, Professor Michael Doherty as head of the Department of Law some seven years ago, six, six years ago. Uh, Michael was the third permanent member of staff in the department. It's now a department of 30. So it's grown enormously in that very short space of time uh, to deliver really top quality education to a whole new generation of students of law. And the trick, I think, for the school, which is it's had the great privilege of assembling itself over a short period of time. So it's very fresh with very talented <coughs> scholars in it and, and very innovative approaches. Uh, to teaching. The trick will be to be around for 50 or 100 years without becoming stale, maintaining that spirit of uh, innovation, uh, maintaining that sense of drive and scholarship. So I want to pay tribute, uh, first of all, to uh, Michael Doherty's leadership, which made that possible. But I really want to pay tribute to the entire staff of the department. I've never seen a group of people put their shoulders to the wheel uh, so enthusiastically and to such great effect. Uh, and equally, we have very many friends and supporters. Uh, uh, many people in this room have been friends and supporters of the department. So I just want to express my gratitude to those three categories of people, the leadership, the staff, uh, and the very many supporters. And I do want to uh, conclude um, by welcoming uh, and, and thanking him for his support, Mr. Justice Liam McKechnie, who's chairing the event at Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and to also say how delighted I am to have with us uh, a, a jurist of such distinction uh, in Eleanor Sharpston, the Advocate General of the Court of Justice of the European Union. I never attend a law event without enjoying it and without learning something, so I'm very much looking forward to this evening. 
and want to conclude by thanking each and every one of you for your support. Thank you very much indeed. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I firstly um, thank everybody who has been involved in inviting me to chair um, this conference this evening, and in particular being here to share the same platform as Eleanor Sharpston. Um, you probably know as much as what you need to know um, about Eleanor, and um, it is all there in print, which can be downloaded at any given time. But there are a couple of snippets, maybe, uh, that might have slipped your, um, your research tool. Um, I should say that from time to time, when you're introducing somebody, uh, it may become slightly desirable to embellish one's career or to say something with poetic license in relation to it. It certainly does not apply uh, under any circumstances to Eleanor. Um, you might know that her mother was from Cove, County Cork, and that if her grandmother had been on time for, to take up her ticket in the Titanic, neither she, her mother, or her grandmother would be here now. And indeed, the lateness of the hour with regard to um, marine matters attaches to Eleanor herself because she was late for and missed the Herald of Free Enterprise in Zeebrugge some time ago, which of course went down uh, with the loss of all lives. Um, in any event, she was born in London. Her family moved to Sao Paulo when she was six and on to Geneva and then Vienna. Uh, in Vienna, she exhibited the first signs of being a serious uh, talent in classical music. Um, and to this day, she plays the viola amongst uh, many other instruments in an amateur choir in Luxembourg. Um, she studied in King's College, Cambridge, 73 to 77, economics, language, and the law. Called to the middle bar and practiced as a barrister for two different periods, 80 to 87, and 90, 1999, 1990 to 2005, taking uh, a silk in the intervening period. Um, she was the legal secretary in the chambers of the Advocate General um, Sir Gordon Slynn, uh, who later became a judge of the court. And she saw him, in fact, in two different capacities. She spent one year when he was Advocate General, and, or maybe two years Advocate General, and one year um, when, he was, um, when he was a judge. So it is fitting, in fact, that she herself should have followed in his footsteps and uh, become appointed Advocate General in 2006. Apart from a very short period of time, She's the longest serving um, Advocate General in the court. Uh, in, in addition, um, she has a glittering academic career. Um, she has lectured in many places, and she has several degrees. She has several um, um, honorships and fellowships of various colleges. Um, from the time she became Advocate General in January uh, 2006, she has, I believe, and I've counted all of these individually, delivered 337 opinions um, in the past 13 years or thereabouts. Um, now that we have passed the 31st of Jan the 31st of October, um, and she is still Advocate General, let's hope that there's another couple of hundred opinions in her. Um, as you can see from the presentation tonight, uh, she's going to speak a little bit um, about the past, the present, and the future. Um, of really where we are in terms of uh, the EU situation presently. Um, can I make it um, clear at the outset that what she's going to say, and um, by way of a presentation, is on the record? Um, but some, when that is finished, there will be about 30 minutes or thereabouts for question and answer, and the Chatham rules apply. Um, there are several good reasons for that, and they will become clear when we start exploring uh, different areas and where frankness uh, will enlighten you much greater than, in fact, if one had to be overly careful about what one says. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I please introduce you to Anna Sharpston. Gentlemen, th thank you, one and all, for the, those very kind introductory phrases. It's always embarrassing standing up to speak after such a glowing account, which you think, yes, they're all waiting for me to demonstrate that I can fly backwards through the air. And you may be, you may be disappointed in that regard. 
Now, I started my intellectual life, in fact, as a classicist with, with Latin and Greek. And so when I was preparing this talk, I thought, right, I will imitate one of the uh, clearest and subtlest of the ancient narrators, one Julius Caesar, and I will divide my narrative, like Gaul, into three parts, to quote it properly, Gallius ist omnis divisa in partis tres. So I'm going to begin with the past, with, you know, the story so far. I then move on to suggest a possible way of looking at and taking stock of some of the present. And then, of course, with considerable trepidation, I grasp my crystal ball firmly in both hands, and I suggest what, what may be some of the challenges facing us in the future and how perhaps we need to set about addressing them if the European project, which I'm proud and happy to have served all my professional life, is to evolve and to prosper. So let's begin by looking back, looking back to try to understand the past. It's almost embarrassing to have to recall this, but, you know, actually the European project started in a very specific place and with a very specific reason for existing. It began in the shadow of the Second World War. And it began with devastation, with destruction, the latest in a series of ever-worsening conflicts on the continent of Europe, the antithesis of the civilised Europe that we like to think that we belong to. Not for nothing, I suggest, does the Schumann Declaration in 1950 open with the words, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. Not for nothing does the preamble of the Cold and Steel Treaty, the precursor to the EEC Treaty and the Euratom Treaty, not for nothing does that preamble state that the signatories are, and I quote, resolved to substitute for age-old rivalries the merging of their essential interests, to create, by establishing an economic community, the basis for a broader and deeper community among peoples long divided by bloody conflicts, and to lay the foundations for institutions which will give direction to a destiny henceforward shared. It's very passionate language, and perhaps it does no harm to remember that right at the start of this story. Because since the foundation of the coal and steel community, and then the EEC, which became the EC, and is now the EU, of course, statement of the obvious, we haven't had a conflict between member states. We have seen on our borders, one might think a little bit too close for comfort, we have seen, a bare 30 years ago, a new conflagration in the former Yugoslavia, over there in the Balkans, remember where World War I began? And of course, more recently, we have been dealing, I suggest rather imperfectly, with millions of displaced persons fleeing another nearby conflict in Syria, what we refer to these days as the refugee crisis. So please, the first and most fundamental gift that the EU has given us and it's a gift that we tend totally to forget these days, is an insurance policy against war in Europe. And I make no apologies for saying, I think it's particularly important to remember that here in Ireland. Because we know very well here that the Good Friday Agreement, which brought a merciful end to the bloodshed in the North, that agreement was built on the fact that the UK and the Republic of Ireland were both member states of the European Union. That's how it was possible to make that agreement. And yet, during a certain referendum in 2016, during the run-up to the referendum, and during the months afterwards, well, I suppose the kindest and politest thing to say would be that there was a kind of Westminster blind spot about the importance of the Good Friday Agreement. 
and doing something in the ensuing negotiations to ensure that we didn't go back to that past of the troubles. So, over, moving on from there, over most of the decades of its existence, the EU has focused on economics, frictionless trade in goods and services, which of course involves both the common customs frontier and common regulatory standards across the trading bloc, combined with mutual recognition. And this is precisely what we have been so carefully and painstakingly been building through the EU project for decades. Because it's this combination that allows the total absence of frontier checks between member states and that allows companies to construct elaborate cross-border supply chains, obvious example being the automotive industry, and that leads to a wide range of consumer choice coupled with high levels of consumer protection. So, you know, in short, the EU has been extremely successful in delivering economic prosperity. Now, there's always a, there's always a problem, there's always a but, but you see. Unfortunately, when you take down the frontiers and you have frontier-less free movement of honest citizens, that also means potentially enhanced free movement rights for criminals and for security threats. And so the EU therefore had to start to accompany that frontier-free, frictionless trading zone with the flanking measures, the creation and development of the Area of Freedom, Security and Justice, AFSJ for short. And it had to put those in place, those measures that begin to address the problems that arise precisely if you do successfully dismantle frontiers and frontier controls. It's great for free movement of workers. It's also fantastic for money laundering, drug stealing, people trafficking, organized crime in general, cross-border terrorism, and so on and so on. And so when you start creating the flanking measures that you need to put in place at an EU level to address those problems, now those measures, many of them necessarily intrude, and I put quotes around the word intrude, they necessarily intrude on policy areas that are sensitive because they lie close to traditional concepts of state sovereignty. Areas like immigration, like criminal law, like security. And very possible for, the, for that reason, there is a certain inbuilt reluctance by member states to cede more power to the <coughs> EU. That was a very quick Michelin-style un peu d'histoire tour of the past. Let's move from there to trying to take stock of the present. And I would suggest to you that we stand at a kind of crossroads here. We have put together within a single customs territory an enormously successful economic single market. We have significant mobility of citizens to live and work, to study and to retire in member states other than the one in which they happen to have been born. And we have these basic flanking measures that deal with much wider issues immigration, criminal law, security, but the collective action in those areas has been perhaps a little bit slow and a little bit cautious. And there is a very big hole where this is my European unity, European identity, and I'm proud of my European identity, should be. And that's because many of the benefits of the EU have been banked, but banked totally invisibly. So the average citizen is in fact unaware that he is deriving benefits from EU law and from everything that's been put in place there. And I'm going, I think the chairman will permit me the time to do the very, very brief diversion. I'm going to tell you a very short true story. In February, before the referendum in 2016, that February, during what we call the blank week at the court, when we don't sit, I had removed myself to go skiing in Kitzbühel. And I got onto a little gondola there, 
and sitting opposite me is a nice young man wearing the red jacket of the Kitzbühel Ski School, the Reuter Teufel. So having grown up in, in Vienna, I say very politely to him, Grüß Gott, to which the answer is, um, I don't speak German. Well, being naturally curious, I, I explored this a little bit. It turned out that he was a very nice young man from, from Essex. He'd begun his skiing career by watching Ski Sunday on the telly. And he thought this was great, fantastic. So he got on a package holiday, thoroughly enjoyed it, had a natural talent for skiing. And the Kitzbühel Ski School had seen a good opportunity because it's an international ski school. They've got lots and lots of clients who would appreciate being taught in English. And so they had sponsored him and supported him and helped him through his training and qualification and so on. So there he was as a ski teacher with the Kitzbühel Ski School, which is how he spent half of his year. Now, one of the problems about being a lawyer, of course, is a thing called professional deformation. So you take this information in and you think, aha, free movement of workers, six months. So I ask him, well, you know, sounds great. In fact, I'm a bit, I'm a bit envious. But what do you do the other half of the year? Oh, he said, there's no problem, because, you see, back in the UK, I trained as a chef. And, I mean, it's really easy. I mean, all you need is your bundle of knives you take with you. And, I mean, of course, everyone speaks English, so there's no problem. And, well, you know, I go off and I fill in down the Costa Brava, the Costa del Sol. Ours is the EU lawyer to herself. So that will be free movement of workers in the winter, and freedom to supply services during the summer months. So having established that his entire economic existence was built upon the exercise of rights granted under EU law, and it, you know, it was quite a long scheme if we had time for this, <laughs> I, I said, tell me, what about this referendum that's coming up in the UK? Oh yes, he said. I think we should leave. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I've just heard a turkey vote for Christmas. No, but really, you know, I've heard the turkey explain to me that Christmas is a wonderful family festival when there is celebration and lots of good food and drink. And the turkey has just told me that Christmas is a good idea. I did spend the remaining two minutes trying to give a sort of EU Law 101 course so that he did actually understand what voting leave might entail for him personally. And he looked a bit puzzled and a little bit concerned by the time we parted ways. <laughs> but so, I mean, you know, this is the point that the benefits of the project, to a very great extent, have, have been banked and banked invisibly. And there is also a basic paradox behind the bigger issues about how much power is at the centre and how much power is still with the member states. Because, I mean, obviously, we want to be kept safe and secure. And we want big problems that overflow national borders, whether that is immigration or climate change <coughs> or whatever, but the big problems that won't stay inside the national box. We want those problems to be managed effectively so maybe Europe will need to play a greater role. But at the same time, the member states do jealously guard their traditional remits. And there is also what, for want of the better acronym, what is called the NIMBY reflex, not in my backyard. That particularly applies when there are lots of asylum seekers who have to be looked after. Because I want to make that illustration indeed precisely from just one area which has given rise to a lot of recent issues and difficult case law, which is precisely how to handle the refugee crisis. Now, to do a very summary sketch for this, the Dublin regulation in its latest incarnation, the Dublin 3 regulation, has a very fine system for what I would call the theoretical balanced allocation of applicants for asylum between all the member states. And if asylum seekers were to arrive and be dropped by helicopter equally in each corner of the 28 member states, the system would work perfectly. 
we then had a problem, because actually that's not the geography of Europe, and as you know as well as I do, in fact, there is immense pressure on the southern member states with those non-floating, half-sinking, inflatable boats making their way or not making their way across the Mediterranean. But there is also the land route, route up the West Balkans, coming across the land bridge from Turkey, and then up along through into Croatia, and then on to the rest of the EU. And that migration explosion gave rise to some grand, case, grand chamber cases in, in my court, particularly case C49016 AS against Slovenia and case C64616 Jafari. And then the migration across the Mediterranean, well, leaving aside the issue about when time starts running from, that appeared in the Mengistev case in case C6716, there is the big background issue of whether really and truly it is an irregular crossing of a border if people are rescued in a search and rescue operation and landed on the shores of a coastal member state that borders the Mediterranean. But it was all of this problem was happening. And then there is a reaction of solidarity, finally belatedly, you may say, and measures are put in place in order to try to help <coughs> Italy and Greece. Two decisions that are taken in September of 2016, decision 2015-1523 and 2015-1601. And they made arrangements for relocating, compulsory relocation of applicants for international protection. And the numbers are big. The first decision is about 40,000 applicants. And a week later, the number has jumped, and you add to that, 120,000 applicants for international protection. You know, there's a big problem, and there is a need for solidarity. And the next thing happens is an application from Slovakia and Hungary, supported by Poland. They bring proceedings before the court and try to get the later of the two decisions annulled. These are joint cases 64315 and 64715. Slovakia and Hungary against the Council. And they throw at the argument about everything that you could conceivably imagine. It's not very often that a judgment of the court begins with a table of contents, but that case does, because otherwise you cannot find your way around the text of the judgment. And the Grand Chamber dismissed that application. And what then happens? Well, actually, uh, member states do not really do very much to put the decisions into force. Some are better than others. Some, some take, you know, a few thousands here and there. Three member states of the four, the group that's often called the Visegrad Four, three states, Poland and Hungary and the Czech Republic, decided that they didn't need to comply with the decision, even though its validity had been upheld by the court. And so they did not communicate to the Commission numbers that they were prepared to take. From memory, I think one of the three agreed that it was going to take 50 refugees. Not even refugees, 50 applicants. And eventually, the Commission did bring infringement proceedings against those three member states. This is cases 71517, 71817, and 71917. And obviously, if you don't communicate the number of people you're going to take, by necessarily and logical extension, you don't then take the people and help to process the applications. And the essential argument that was being made was because the member state retains responsibility for national security within its territory, you can unilaterally decide not to apply an agreed and valid collective measure of solidarity. Now, I discovered before we started the proceedings this evening that some of you have been kind enough to read an opinion that came out on the 31st of October. The date was not accidental. Um, in which I waxed very passionate 
about the fact that I think this is absolutely not on. And I even use some rather colourful language about the importance of solidarity as the lifeblood of the, of the project. But, obviously, we'll see what the court does with it. It's now in delivery. But, but the essential point here is, here is a problem that manifestly needs to be solved at EU level. You cannot solve it individually at member state level. And the story so far, unfortunately, very clearly indicates and illustrates the weaknesses and limitations of collective action if everyone just looks after their own bailiwick. And a checklist, and it certainly wouldn't be an exhaustive checklist, right? But a checklist of what would need to be sorted out in respect of that single problem would surely include such matters as reform to the Dublin Three regulation, what do you do about search and rescue in the Mediterranean to save boatloads of migrants from drowning in the Met? What about a collective agreement to share out responsibility for processing those who are rescued? And for geographical reasons, they're going to be landed in member states that border the Mediterranean rather than in member states that border the Baltic. Think about the map. And developing programs to give more significant levels of aid to the states from which the would-be migrants are coming. Put bluntly, you know, if the, if the prosperous EU does not want to be a magnet for the less fortunate, well, it needs to help create conditions where there is more incentive for them to stay where they are, and it would obviously help if we weren't in a situation where there are major wars happening geographically rather close to where we are. And against the background of all of that, there is what, from an EU27 perspective, there is what is the distraction that is Brexit. Now, I am a Luxembourger as much as I am a Brit. And I am here, ladies and gentlemen, I please, I am very, very firmly wearing my Luxembourger hat. Let's just not be, have any confusion on that. Wearing my Luxembourger hat, yes, you heard me right. Bra Brexit is a distraction. Seen from an EU27 perspective, the three years since that referendum in 2016 in the UK have been spent discovering that those governing the UK have <clears throat> difficulty in specifying the details of the desired new alternative bilateral relationship, a relationship that will simultaneously respect all the red lines that have been pasted, painted on the floor and B, will lead all the, yield all the desired economic and security benefits, while C, simultaneously leaving the UK entirely free to strike multiple trade deals with other global powers that will naturally be more advantageous to the UK negotiating on its own than the deals that the EU as a global trading power has already signed or is currently negotiating. Brexit is a distraction. It is a distraction because it has devoured time, money, resources, and effort that Luxembourg had firmly in place that badly need to be spent on dealing with other matters, both nationally within the UK, but, but within the EU27. For three million EU 27 citizens who are living and working in the UK, for about a million UK citizens who are living and working in the EU 27, these last three years have been a period of personal and economic uncertainty. And if I look at the micro level, at the little team of people who work with me, most of whom are not UK nationals, we have seen stress, unhappiness, and Brexit-related illness all take their toll. But Brexit has had one positive side effect. It has made the rest of us realise just how interconnected our economies now are and how much hitherto invisible benefit does in fact come from that interconnectedness within the EU. And it's really interesting, if you go to the 
Eurobarometer, which takes the temperature, takes the pulse of how people are feeling about the European project in the different member states. It's really interesting to see that nations that were previously a bit Eurosceptic, for example, the, the Netherlands, for example, Denmark, in those nations, enthusiasm for the EU is now at an all-time high. So it's nice to know that there's some benefit that's come out of the Brexit process so far. I'm going to turn to the third part of this presentation, facing the challenges of the future, and I begin with an uncomfortable truth. The world doesn't owe us a nice, comfortable living just because we're Europeans. We are neither in the colonial, imperial world of the of the 19th century, nor in its 20th century aftermath, we are firmly launched into the 21st century. And in economic terms, we live in a world of big players, both the existing powers and the emerging powers. Little checklists might say USA, Russia, China, Japan, India, Brazil, Argentina, Korea, Canada, and you can add your favorite names to that list. So, to keep our European economy in contention, we need a Europe-wide strategy for research, for innovation and investment. We need common rules and standards and incentives and measures to ensure that enterprise is encouraged, it has to be, but that workers are also protected. And we have to have enough people working productively and we have to be good enough at what we collectively do to finance the social care, the health care, the unemployment benefit, the pensions and so on, that we consider are essential to respect and look after all members of our society. And, you know, if, as is now the case, the majority of EU member states share a common currency, the euro, well, there are inevitable implications in terms of monetary and fiscal policy that will need further reflection and elaboration, and I'm not going to slide into the economics lecture at this point. So there are also, as well as all of that, this is all the things we haven't been getting on with because of Brexit, right? There are also some obvious challenges that can only be addressed through EU-wide action. Start the list, climate change, environmental damage, Putting together a comprehensive and intelligent policy on migration in the widest sense. Financing infrastructure and economic support for disadvantaged regions. That would just be the start of the list. You can make it much, much longer. Stepping even further back. If we like living comfortably in a liberal, tolerant, multicultural democracy, we cannot just sit back and assume that that is the natural state of affairs. <clears throat> because there is plenty of evidence out there to show that actually it isn't. We will have to counter the resurgent populism that has taken root in disaffection and alienation and that is rampant in environments when too many are unskilled, probably unemployed, have no obvious future, and are firmly convinced that they, meaning those ones in power, do not care a damn about us, the victims. Victim mentality is very dangerous. It is only a short step away from let's turn on those others and get our revenge. And we owe it to our citizens, but also to the third country nationals living peaceably within our borders. We owe it to them to keep them safe from harm. Be that harm individual lawlessness, organized crime, or terrorist action. And that takes you across to the rule of law, doesn't it? We have to use the collective power of the European Union to uphold the rule of law and to curb politicians who rise to power by exploiting and feeding that populism with sound bites and who then try to dismantle any institutional structures that may get in their way. There's some judgments of the court out recently in relation to Poland, but there's been some interesting things happening in other places as well that show that the rule of law 
may not be as solidly anchored as we'd perhaps like it to be, and we must, repeat must, safeguard that rule of law. Because we saw in Germany in the 1930s what happens when a populist leader rises to power and then dismantles the legal checks and constitutional guarantees that ensure the balance of power between branches of government and that protect the rights of all, including unpopular minorities. <coughs> now, I have no idea whether the right model for Europe, put quotes around that, is a single-speed model, a two-speed model, or a multi-speed model, whether it's the EU plus the EEA, or whether it's integrated in some other way. Before our collective attention was distracted by Brexit, there were some important and thoughtful <coughs> dialogues, some exploration of these issues that was starting to take place. And it seems to me that we, the EU27, Luxembourger hat, must not respond to Brexit by adopting a Europe is our bunker mentality. We're going to have to have the courage and the self-confidence to resume those discussions and to think creatively and imaginatively about our shared future. I am passionately convinced that we need to find a way of welding Europe together, of building on the work that Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann and Conrad Adenauer did in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. In the past, there was an obvious model. I mean, this nation state often forged its national identity through military prowess, through conquest, through nationalism, and through fostering a sense of superiority over its neighbors. And we cannot foster our European identity in that way. It is nevertheless crucial that citizens should buy into and own the European project. It is vital that it should belong to them rather than be perceived as the abstract and remote creation of a Brussels-based elite. And I think that communication, which really is not the same thing as indoctrination, but communication plays an essential role here. Because politicians throughout the EU have for decades tended to present everything popular as their own national triumph and everything less popular as an unwelcome interference by Brussels. And how you present events tends automatically to colour how they are received and the wider conclusions that we draw from them. Let me offer you two illustrations just to make this point. Imagine, imagine that a strong earth tremor causes significant damage in a region of a member state. What do you put in the press coverage? Does that press coverage focus exclusively on photos of distraught villages and collapsed buildings and, and statements by national politicians? Or does it also highlight the fact that neighboring member states send rescue teams to help dig survivors out of the rubble and that the EU has allocated X million euros out of common funds to help with rebuilding work? What do you show in the press coverage? Second illustration. At a big sporting event, let's take the Olympic Games. At the Olympics, does the medals table, just as now, list each member state individually? Or do you also show a collective European Union table? Hmm? In case you wonder, I did the calculation. If you take the 2016 Summer Olympics, the runaway winners of the Olympics were the EU 28. 106 gold, 110 silver, 110 bronze, 326 medals in all, way ahead, way ahead of the actual winners, who were the USA, who had 121 medals in all. 
And by the way, if you recalculate for the EU27 and you take out the UK, which did exceptionally well in Rio, the EU is still comfortably ahead of the field. You come up with 255 medals. Now, I'm sure you've never, you've never done that calculation and you've never heard those figures because we never present them. We just look at the individual member states. Right, let's draw this together. What I have offered you today is a sketch, obviously painted with very broad brushstrokes. It is a personal, at times it is a passionate view, of where we've come from, where we are, and where we need to get to. And I'm not saying that my, my vision, if, if you could dignify it with that word, is necessarily the right one or the only one. But I would close with a plea. The European project really matters. It is not, unfortunately, some of my other nationality fellow countrymen who are presently vying for domestic power do not understand this. It is not about a bookkeeping calculation of what precisely do I pay in and what precisely do I get out. I said something fairly passionate about this in the Visegrad cases. I suppose another way of putting it would be to say that the European project is about something bigger and rather more important and worthwhile than putting a message on the side of a bus saying we pay 350 million a week to Brussels, let's fund our NHS instead. The European project is about peace, security and prosperity for ourselves and for those who come after us in this beautiful and richly diverse continent in which we're privileged to live. It is about how to transform that ideal, that goal, into practical daily reality. And to do that, Europe needs our engagement. Europe needs us to pour our individual gifts and insights into the collective endeavor. It needs us as European citizens to give meaning to that phrase that has come into our legal vernacular, of citizenship of the Union, and to make our contribution to the European demos, to be committed, not as Greek city-state hoplites with shield and sword, but to be committed as engaged and creative thinkers and doers for the common good. That, I suggest to you, that is the challenge of the European project in the 21st century, and that is the challenge that we must rise to. Thank you very much.